seconder. Mark threw the parchment pages down onto his bedroom floor angrily. We should have known, he shouted. It was as much as our fault as it was Bobby's. Courtney and Mark had waited until they got back home to Stony Brook before reading Bobby's latest journal. After saying goodbye to Bobby in the abandoned subway station, their journey back home was uneventful. They traveled the same route as the one that brought them to the flume in the Bronx, taking the subway to 125th Street and catching the first commuter train back to Connecticut. Once back in their hometown, they went straight to Mark's house and locked themselves in his bedroom where they could read Bobby's journal in private. It's not our fault, agreed, argued Courtney. The Malago are like a step above primitive. How could we have known they'd figure out how to make a bomb with that stuff? Because we read the journal, countered Mark. We knew the same things that Bobby did. Press told him to never bring anything from one territory to the next. We read that, but we did it anyway. Mark paced around the floor out of sheer nervous energy. We helped Bobby, agreed Courtney, and maybe we helped that Malago too. To be honest, I hope they do make a bomb. That'll blow those Bedouin creeps away. They deserve it. You don't get it, argued Mark. The Malongo aren't ready for this kind of power. They don't know how to control it. Now Courtney was getting angry. She jumped up and said, What are you saying? Only socially evolved brilliant people are allowed to blow themselves up? No, Mark shot back. It takes socially evolved brilliant people to figure out how not to blow themselves up. Look at it this way. The Malago are pissed off, and they should be. The Bedouin have been torturing them for centuries. Now suddenly they're given a weapon that's so powerful they can wipe out their enemies with the push of a button. They don't really understand it. They really don't know how to control it, but they're angry enough to use it anyway. If that tax stuff is as powerful as Bobby wrote, then they could end up killing themselves as well. This made Courtney stop. Is it really possible to use a battery to set that stuff off? She asked thoughtfully. I don't know, I answered Mark. I suppose so. If tack is that volatile, then a small electric charge could set off a chain reaction and boom! The two fell silent for a moment, imagining the consequences. I guess the trick is to be somewhere else when the button gets pushed, said Courtney. I don't think they're smart enough to figure out how to make a timer. It wouldn't matter, said Mark soberly. Tack isn't anything like I've ever heard of. If a little bit can make an explosion that big, then the amount Bobby described in that ore car would not only destroy the Bedouin palace, it would level the Malago village, too. And if the explosion makes fire the way it did with those scarecrow targets, then it could create a firestorm. Every living thing for miles around it would be torched. The Bedouin, the Malago, the farm, the forest. And Bobby, Alder, Lore, and Press, too, said Courtney slowly. I guess this Figgis guy really is a merchant of death. Mark picked up the latest journal and scanned it, looking for something. It didn't take him long to find it. Listen to this, he said. This is what Laura said to Bobby. Mark read from the journal. My mother explained that there are many territories, and they are all about to reach an important time, a turning point, she called it. It is a time when the outcome will either send the territory toward peace and prosperity or plunge its people into chaos and destruction. Courtney said, Yeah, and if the Malago beat the Bedouin, then everything will be okay. I don't think that's it, said Mark. I think it's all about tack. Think about it. The Malago have been slaves of the Bedouin for centuries. If they fight them and lose, then it will be business as usual. But if Malago tipped the balance by using something as horrible as that explosive, then who knows what it could lead to. Then we've got to try and undo it, countered Courtney. How? was Mark's obvious question. It's not like we can go through the flumes. It doesn't work for us, remember? Courtney paced, her mind kicking into overdrive. Then maybe we can send something to Bobby, she said. Like a... like a... Like a what? shouted Mark. We can't send anything to him. It would only make things worse. The only thing we can do is... Ding dong! Mark was interrupted by the doorbell. The two instantly fell silent. You expecting somebody? asked Courtney. We skipped school today, Mark said nervously. Maybe they're coming to check up on me. The doorbell rang again. Let's hide, said Mark. Courtney gave him a sarcastic look and said, Hide? Give me a break. I think we have bigger things to worry about than getting caught for skipping school. Answer the dumb door. Courtney was right, thought Mark. Who cared if they got busted for skipping school? Whoever was at the door, he'd deal with them and get back to the bigger problem at hand. When he got downstairs, he hes hesitated a second and tried to look sick in case it really was somebody from school coming to check up on him. He gave a, a sick little cough and then called out with a weak voice, I'm coming. He got to the door, unlocked it, swung it open, and then shouted, Bobby! Indeed, Bobby Pendragon was standing at the front door wearing the same clothes he had worn the night he disappeared. The Malago leather clothes were history. Hey, Mark, he said casually, can I come in? Courtney came running down the stairs on a tear. Bobby? she shouted. 
Bobby stepped into Mark's house and gave Courtney a little smile. Miss me, he said. Courtney grabbed him in a hug, and Mark hugged the two of them together. Bobby was home. He was safe. Everything was going to be okay. When they finally pulled away from the group hug, Mark and Courtney looked at Bobby in disbelief. This was too good to be true. A few seconds ago, they were worried about never seeing him again. Now here he was, standing right in front of them. But Bobby looked different. Both Courtney and Mark noticed it. It was still Bobby, no doubt about that. But he looked tired, like he had gone through an ordeal that took a lot out of him. Are you okay, man? asked Mark. You kind of look sick. I'm not sick. I'm totally beat, was Bobby's answer. I gotta lie down. Mark and Courtney quickly led Bobby up the stairs to Mark's bedroom. They watched him as he walked and saw that he was a little unsure on his feet. They also noticed streaks of blood on his cheeks that came from many tiny cuts all over his face. Obviously, a lot had happened since they saw him leave through the gloom on his way back to Dendron. To Mark and Courtney, only a few hours had passed. But as they had already figured out, time here on Second Earth and time in the other territories weren't relative. Bobby could have been gone for much longer than a few days for all they knew. Bobby looked as if he'd been through a war, but neither Mark nor Courtney wanted to ask him about it. They both figured that he'd tell them when he was ready. So without another word, they followed Bobby into Mark's room and watched as he lay down on the bed. I gotta get home, said Bobby weakly, but I want to rest up first. Is it okay? Absolutely, answered Mark. Whatever you want. Thanks, man, said Bobby and put his head down on the pillow. Mark cringed, wondering how he was going to explain the streaks of blood on the white pillowcase to his mother. But then he felt bad for even thinking so selfishly and put the thought out of his head. Will you guys come with me? asked Bobby without opening his eyes. Sure, Bobby, answered Courtney. Uh, where? Bobby spoke we weakly as if he were nearly asleep. To my house. Everybody must be going nuts looking for me. I'm going to need you guys to help explain things. Mark and Courtney exchanged looks. Both knew what the other was thinking. Bobby's house wasn't there anymore. His family had disappeared, and along with them, so had any history of the Pendragon family ever having existed. His parents, his sister, even his dog were just gone. The police had launched an investigation to try and figure out what had happened to them, but so far they had come up empty. Whatever it takes, said Courtney. We'll be there for you. Bobby smiled. Mark, on the other hand, was dying with curiosity. He didn't want Bobby to nod off before finding out what had happened on Dendron. So tell us what happened! Courtney gave Mark a punch in the arm. Ow! yelped Mark and grabbed a stinging arm. Go to sleep, Bobby, said Courtney. Tell us later. Bobby didn't open his eyes, but he chuckled as his friend's curiosity. Oh yeah, I almost forgot, he said while reaching up to his shirt. He unbuttoned a few buttons, reached his hand in, and pulled out a roll of parchment paper. It's all there, he said, fading fast. Everything that happened since I wrote last. Wake me up when you're finished. That was the last thing he said. Bobby was in dreamland, the roll of parchment paper still in his hand. Mark glanced at Courtney, hesitated a moment, then took the precious journal. Courtney took the folded-up comforter from the bottom of Mark's bed and laid it gently over Bobby, right up to his chin. This was probably the first time he had slept in a bed in a long time, and she wanted to make sure he was as safe and comfortable as possible. Then the two of them walked quietly to the far side of the room. Should we go downstairs and leave him alone? whispered Mark. No, was Courtney's reply. Nothing we could do would wake him up now. Mark nodded. He didn't want to leave either. He slipped the fam familiar leather twine off the rolled-up scroll and opened it enough to read the very first line. Journal number four? asked Courtney. Journal number four, answered Mark. The two sat down next to each other on the floor and began to read the final chapter in Bobby's adventure.